Hey, Fiends of the Pod, this is your host, film critic and comedian Nate Wyckoff, reminding you to like, subscribe, and comment. You can also go to cultandclassicfilms.com slash subscribe and sign up to have cult exclusive movies sent to your door every single month. These are ultra low budget exclusive films that we get to you in the best quality possible with tons of extras like commentaries, milk caps, autographed posters, slip covers, all sorts of neat things. And remember, every time you like, subscribe and buy a movie from us, you prevent Michael Bay from making one more film. So go ahead, subscribe and enjoy. Welcome to Compton Classic. <laughs> Welcome, fans and fiends of the pod, to a brand new episode of Cult and Classic. Very excited for this one, uh, for this dragtastic extravaganza special episode. We have two films made by drag queens. First up, we have Star Booty, starring RuPaul, uh, RuPaul Charles, or R.A. Charles, depending on which credit you're looking at in the credits. And then we also have uh, San Francisco legend Peaches Christ's film, All About Evil. Uh, very excited. We're going to tackle Star Booty first, uh, just to kind of, again, remind everyone who we are and why you are hearing us today. I'm Nate Wyckoff, host and film critic for HorrorNews.net. With me, as always, is Jeff Tucker. How are you doing, Jeff? What's up? My booty's pretty regular. Your booty is regular. I think uh, every housemate you've ever had can vouch for that. Amanda Longley, you're also with us. How are you doing, Mandy? I'm good, and my stars are booty. Ah, uh, yeah. I think, and and people who've never heard of this RuPaul movie, Star Booty, uh, if you're looking it up, it is uh, two R's, so S-T-A-R-R Booty. Okay, uh, this movie's from 2007. All of My Evil's from 2010, so they're relatively uh, close in time, yet they are very, very different films. Uh, just a, a little background on Star Booty. So in the 80s, there were three short films uh, that RuPaul and fellow uh, New York underground uh, performers and club kids and drag queens and trans individuals made um, that amount to about a feature length film. They're very much in the style of black exploitation movies from the 70s. And uh, this was sort of RuPaul's attempt to make a feature and revitalize uh, that, that character that she started uh, all those years ago, some 30 years prior. I think the results are interesting. Uh, the plot is that Star Booty, played by RuPaul, is a s sort of secret federal agent um, and who's at the top of her game, but she's also uh, the most highly paid, uh, most beautiful supermodel of the world. And in this tale, her adopted, um, her it's an adopted niece. It's not really an adopted daughter, right? Anyway, Cornisha has been abducted uh, by someone, and it turns out it's... Uh, abducted by RuPaul's orphanage nemesis, uh, America, uh, Annika Manners, who's played by famous uh, woman and early trans trailblazer, Candace Kane. So basically they meet and there's a whole little twist at the end, uh, but as in all of these sort of 70s style black exploitation films, the hero uh, overcomes and there's a lot of dick in this movie. There is so many penis, so many penis. Um, a bushel of penis. <laughs> bushel of penis. And, uh, and I think that that was, uh, I know just to start off for me, it was surprising. It's not offensive per se, but it is surprising because we really don't, even in the exploitation world, we do not get a lot of full frontal male nudity. We get a little bit of, of uh, or a lot bit of full female nudity. And then if we do get some full male nudity, it's it's like a glimpse or it's a surprise. Like a, I think at the end of like uh, um, uh, the the famed I'm blanking on the name, uh, but some some movies have that, and it's usually a twist or like a big moment. And in this, there are just penises everywhere. Uh, characters get uh, RuPaul's character Star Booty goes undercover as a prostitute, and it's the entire center of the film is just small little vignettes where various adult male act, film actors uh, pull out their penises. And, uh, and that's, there's really not much art to that. Um, but I don't know, Jeff, what was your take? Because when I first saw it, I was taken aback, but then I was also like, oh, this is what a lot of sexploitation movies do for, for straight male viewers. Yeah. And now... Kinda, yeah, that was my first reaction. I was, I was like, oh, did RuPaul say like, 
I'm not seeing enough penis in films and I'm going to correct it in this one film. Just like I'm going to compensate for all of the films that, that, uh, that I've been missing. And uh, this is going to be that masterpiece of a penis film. Uh, I, it, it was, it was to me, I wouldn't say like uncomfortable. It was just like, uh, okay, I get it. I've seen it. I've seen a penis now over and over again. Uh, there was like it, it kind of like escalated in in terms of like the pornographic nature of it. Uh, mm-hmm. It started out pretty innocent of uh, you know there's a penis on the screen, and then it kind of escalated into to, you know some you know it's essentially uh, pornographic scenes uh, where with uh, you know men actually you know like it's off screen but you know it's, it's, it's like simulated it's sex simulated sex yeah. and you know ejaculation so uh it was uh it, i would say gratuitous and unnecessary. that's a good word for it <laughs> <laughs> there was a lot of there was a lot of gratuitous penis and it was yeah mandy what was your say so slow. so as a uh, mandy mandy uh had an unsuspecting friend watch this with her uh, and i think that that is hilarious the, the text chain that came in uh uh, made me cringe and smile. But again, I think I think you hit the nail on the head, Jeff. It's gratuitous, but sometimes some people uh, gratuitous nudity is usually f- fine for me and can make uh, an otherwise really dull film mildly entertaining. Um, and so I respect the choice, but I was not the target audience as a straight white male for this. Um, I guess racism matters. I don't think I was the target audience as a straight female. That's either. that's that's true. My wife was like, it's you know. Uh, and and obviously in this particular cast, we don't have any uh, uh, LGBTQIA individuals, uh, male individuals, but I will say that it does seem that um, gay men prefer, uh, you know, dick pics more than straight women. Because my wife was like, I don't even really, the penis, a nice set of abs is better than a penis. Like, I don't, it's not like it's attractive. I mean, from my perspective, it just always looks like uh, an H.R. Geiger painting of an alien bursting through something. Like, but again, uh, that's not my thing. So I totally respect it. You used the word pornographic, Jeff, which is interesting because I was trying to decide how this film got in a wide release because it didn't. And in fact, mm-hmm. it's out of print. Uh, if you try to find it, it's quite pricey right now. Um, it, it's sort of... Uh, I don't. I, I think it might. I think it would go beyond the NC-17 rating because it does get sexual nature. There's actually one scene that surprised me um, when RuPaul actually grabs a man's exposed penis, mm. um, and that's just it's that contact that you just you won't see in a in a regular release film. Um, or if you do, I think there was a film that that I reviewed for News and that will eat me from a couple of years ago. Um, it's it's a fake penis. You know what I mean? Like they, they may do things like that, but they're really going to avoid actual sexual contact. Um, and this one didn't. Uh, and again, the sex is simulated. It's, it's clearly not real sex, but the penises are real. And there, I didn't count, but it would have been interesting to watch the film with like a clicker, you know, and just click, click, because it really is scene after scene in the middle. Um, to be fair yeah. too- Some of them reappear. Yeah, they do. And they reuse scenes in this. Um, I, I think- uh, we get, and, and to be fair, we do get um, some some female nudity as well from the the uh, the trans actresses. Candace Kane is briefly uh, nude in this, or has a has a, a flash scene, um, and uh, the the character that plays Cornisha, which is a name that just cracks me up every time. Uh, played by Jasmine Jimenez, uh, is is topless several times. So it is a sort of an equal opportunity nudity film which is refreshing because i think that when you get a film that's you know geared towards a gay audience you tend to get uh you know male nudity or if it's a i don't know uh the great or extent any, yeah i mean every other film on the planet exactly exactly male gaze yeah, yeah. um the, so but that's just i think what's the the first thing that pops out about star booty is it's really surprising just the tip. <laughs> and they're the other thing that comes is that when you actually watch the movie, this film was sort of touted uh, for those of us who follow like RuPaul's Drag Race and the drag community um, at large. Star Booty, she actually mentioned it and had a couple of challenges based on it uh, on, on a season or two of Drag Race. And then we sort of didn't hear about Star Booty, uh, which is unusual because 
RuPaul is the master marketer. Like that is her her most amazing skill other than looking amazing. And um, and I would say acting. She's actually a, a very good actress. If you watch AJ and the Queen on Netflix, although Netflix didn't pick it up for a second season because they're terrible people. I'm just Rose kidding, City. Netflix. Yeah. Oh yeah, she's she's done great work. Um, she yeah. she's she's very skilled. This movie is occasionally very difficult to watch. Uh, at least I found it that way. And it's not it's not because of the content per se. I just feel like it uh, is maybe poorly made in in a lot of key areas. Uh, again, it's a black exploitation um, film homage. So I get a lot of the references as far as like, um, you know, the bad fight scenes. I'm in on that. Um, yeah. the, but there's certain things that's just the corners cut feel like they didn't have to be cut. I'm thinking the very opening scene, we get this um, weird montage of like frames playing videos all over the screen, sort of like an episode of 24, um, where it's just like scene, 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 scene. And that's okay, but it's very rapid and it's very uneven. And uh, 70s did mess with things like that, uh, different graphical portrayals, but they actually reuse shots within those frames. And they're not necessarily like uh, cohesive together. Like this just happened and now this is happening, but then this just happened again. It's just, it's all over the place. Um, and also little touches like the guns that they fire have no gunshot neither the sound nor a gun flash. And I mean, uh, in a zero budget film that can be accomplished. Um, yeah. So those things really, I mean, black exploitation films had those. So I, I don't really, it's, there's a level of, of polish that even for a cheaply made film, I, I think is lacking. I don't know what your guys' impression of that was as you were watching this. I actually didn't mind that so much. Um, like even like the beginning, like I was actually even up to like the really like uh, very soap opera styled mm -hmm. uh, like dialogue and and scening like I could almost follow that up uh, until the point where the the movie kind of broke broke down into like from kind of the story into like this weird kind of it was almost like a forty minute long montage of like John's like a hooker yeah yeah or John's and it was like but it wasn't. A, a movie in that section it was it was a weird kind of just like there's even a dance scene at one point yeah there's um, just like a spontaneous yeah. dance scene um almost and like a the skit thing, show the thing that got like i laughed out loud was <laughs> when they get back to the plot uh rupaul walks through a door stops and it basically re-explains the plot of the film yes <laughs> i i just i just got i was just like it was a deep gut laugh because it was hilarious because it was like whoever was directing this knew that they had strayed from the plot for too long that they had to re-explain it. <laughs> it yes, like and and just to give people a credit, so Mike Ruiz uh, is the director of this film. Mike Ruiz is a very well-known fashion photographer and a reoccurring photographer on RuPaul's Drag Race for a lot of the mini challenges. I photographs the girls a lot. Um, this is his only feature, and. Uh, I, this is not a dig on Michael Reese's talent as a photographer, but there's a lot of very basic cinematography understanding that is missing from the work done on this film. Uh, in certain cases, it could add to the camp factor. Um, I think the he did not make the original 80s shorts of Star Booty, but I think that um, those are better and they were recorded on like a camcorder and like two VHSs back and forth, like the real old school. Uh, it, this this just it's very disjointed and a lot of it is there's a lot of shaky cam like moving it all around during the fight scenes especially I'm looking at people's feet a lot when they're not moving um, just it was it was not the star of the show um, but yeah. unfortunately it did pull focus for me quite a few times it wasn't the worst I've seen I mean there's there's a couple of scenes in the middle especially of the New York cityscape that I really enjoyed. I thought that there were moments where I was like, oh, I'm getting this, I'm getting this New York City vibe, you know, the, the, the cab driver, the 80s, 90s, um, that grit that we got for so many years until, you know, now New York's always portrayed as kind of a glittering paradise. I, I think that was, that was great, but it does, it does come in, in 
flits and spurts rather than a steady stream throughout the film. Yeah. Let's play a clip real quick. This is in the beginning when Star Booty has just found out that uh, Cornisha has been abducted and she's talking to her boss uh, and, and she's like asking about um, any leads. There we go. Forensic team come up with anything from Cornish's dormitory at the Tuskegee Institute? Yes, they canvassed her dorm room from top to bottom, and what they found there is, well, frankly, it's rather shocking. Well, what, Max? I mean, I can handle it. Listen, Star Booty, this may be hard for you. Max, I can handle it. I'm a top agent. Just give me the facts. You're right. Well, here it goes. In addition to all the usual things one would expect to find in a teenager's dorm room, the forensics team found 17 vials of crack cocaine, 36 used dental dams, and a box of dead gerbils. Oh my. I, now, <laughs> if you just listen to it, it, it it's, you can hear that staccato like delivery that RuPaul's giving to every line. It is clearly intentional people I, you know i'm looking through a lot of reviews of this people are like oh the acting's terrible yes it's intentional i mean i don't whether it works or not for you is a discussion to have but there's no question that rupaul is not intentionally chewing every scene here um and i think that's one of the things that works i mean especially if you're a fan of rupaul from drag race and other things she's done um she's aware of uh the joke so uh, I think that was good. The Max uh, is, is the character who is her boss uh, and love interest. Um, he's an actress, excuse me, an actress. Ah, he's an actor. Uh, he's been in um, several, I, I don't know if they're adult films or not. I have not seen them, but I would imagine so. Uh, Gale Force, Men's Room 2, that sounds to me like an adult film, but he's been in a lot of non-adult films as well. So uh, he's, got, he's got some acting chops and he is a recurring character in the show yeah, he, was, he was pretty good yeah, yeah I mean, actually yeah, right? there, there's so i i do think that everyone on here is actually pretty decent but it's hard to tell because the entire film is 80 yard like all the dialogue is recorded separately uh some of least. it was bad like and 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 like real bad and yeah. again it, it's it's one of those things where i assume that that was intentional for two reasons probably one it's often easier because you don't have to worry about room tone and all that stuff um even though you have that extra step of recording dialogue you don't have to worry about getting clean audio at the time you're just worried about the visuals um and the other thing being is that so many of those black exploitation films they didn't have the money uh, for knowledgeable sound people. So they ADR'd a lot. And also sometimes these films used actors who didn't speak very clearly or they didn't speak uh, fantastic English. And so they would dub over them. I mean, how many, how many Italian American co-productions have, you know, we done probably on this pod that we didn't realize that they're just dubbed because they couldn't understand the English that they were using. So that, that's definitely intentional. It's very distracting when they had other people uh, dub the voices for characters, especially um, Jasmine Jimenez is dubbed by a completely different person. And it is like the most insane, high-pitched joke voice. It's like this the whole time and everybody, like it's, it's worse than that, I think. It's pretty bad. And, um, <laughs> it's pretty bad. It's, it's real bad. And uh, it's, it's, this is, this is something I found. If you go on IMDb, it's always fun to look at the reviews to see what other people think. And this is someone who actually did um, uh, voiceover for this film and did the voice of Cornisha. Now, this is what they claim. I do the voice of Cornisha, quote, which one reviewer had said they used real women's voices to overdub some of the drag queens and transsexuals. Ha, ha, ha. It's a man, too. No, we know that that you were uh, that you were a man doing the voice of Cornisha. No one was questioning that. I cannot fathom. Um, it's it's just very very extreme in the cartooniness of those few voices that other actors did the voices for. Um, because Rue obviously does her own dialogue and all that stuff, um, and Candace Kane plays her own dialogue. So and they play it as they would speak, even though they're doing ridiculous dialogue. They're speaking like them, and these other voices are insanely off the wall. And that really threw me off, especially during like the end of the movie where mm. Cornisha reveals that she's been in league with the villain all along, and it was just to get Star Booty in there because she hates her mom. 
that I feel like that scene could have like could have been fun, kind of like the beginning of the film, but it that that put in particular uh, triggered me a little bit. It was it was a, it, it was a little hard to you know get into the kind of the silliness of the moment because uh, I just kept being like, "What is this voice coming out of this?" The voice distracted, and it's a bummer too because um, I think Candace Kane does a great job acting in this. She actually like matches Rue's like ridiculous ham fistedness um, mm-hmm. in this very well. In fact, let's let's listen to another clip here. Um, this is Candace Kane uh, and Starbody, who just so happened to actually be sisters, which they didn't know about. And uh, Candace Kane's character, Annika, also happens to be Cornisha's real mother, which she didn't know. These are all those things that are, this is sort of like- uh, Old telenovela. <laughs> yes, it's a hardcore telenovela style thing, Days of Our Lives, the whole deal. And also, it reminded me of It Came From Uranus, where the end is just this like slam and slam and slam of all these like cliches intentionally, but it's almost like, I don't even, I don't even know what to do with this information. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, yeah, let's listen to this. You're honest and upfront. Two things I absolutely deplore in a person. Excuse me. <gasps> Fatty, fatty, rooty, tooty, eat the pain. Little star booty. <laughs> you fucking bitch. Yes. <laughs> That's one of my favorite moments is when she's like, you fucking bitch. She's like, yes, and <laughs> that, because that, that is funny. Um, but there's a lot of punchlines in this film that don't land. Uh, and there's also a lot of jokes. If, if you watch RuPaul, again, you know RuPaul loves two things, dick jokes and poop jokes. Mm-hmm. And there are a lot of fart jokes in this film. They're like, they won't be there at all. And then there will be an entire scene that centers around farting. Belching. Belching I, as well. I would almost say like the belching became more, more. Uh, well, so upset. I think the most noticeable fart scene in this is when uh, her, the first John she works for, Old he just, smelly. yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah. He just wants uh, someone to fart in his face while he masturbates. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And, uh, and not only that, but he has a uh, old smeller played by Richard A. Lynch, another uh, adult actor. He has the most insane Irish brogue phony accent and he wears a little bowler's cap. I just wanted to see like a four leaf clover stuck in the cap. Cause it was like, I'm like, are you, are you a leprechaun? Is that literally what this scene is about? Um, and we literally just see shots of RuPaul going cross-eyed while farting with her head out the window. I, I don't know. What was your guys' take on that? Did you enjoy that? Because that was a little stale for me. Oh, of course I enjoyed it because it was hard <laughs> jokes. I was like, this is the best part of the whole movie. Well, except it was just super weird. But like, I was like, farting. Yeah, that's great. But yeah, I in general just love RuPaul's sense of humor and just how like on runway, like when they do all like the puns and the ridiculous jokes. And like mm-hmm. this movie definitely brought that. I, I was hoping for more, actually. I would have loved yeah. RuPaul. Granted, there's been more um, uh, uh, inside jokes and, and dialogue and things added to the RuPaul canon since, you know, the, mm-hmm. the 13 years since this film was, was released. But, like, um, I totally could have done with, you know, somebody turning and saying, you know, like, she already done had hers is, you know what I mean? Like, there could have been mm-hmm. so much more. But it is there. Especially as a, as a drag race super fan, you can certainly see it in there. Um my favorite two jokes came literally in the in like the final 10 seconds of the film uh prior to the credits it's my favorite joke is when um actually my second favorite joke is the very last scene of the movie when uh star booty and max um have have announced their love for each other and they're kissing and rupaul's back leg comes up very feminine and it pans out and shows that Max to reach is standing on like a gaffer's box, mm-hmm. like literally sit like that's that that was hilarious, and that's the last scene. And then the black screen of credits comes up, and it says, um, "In loving memory of Jerry Falwell, <laughs> the famously anti-gay, nasty piece of shit uh, televangelist," <laughs> and that made me. I lost it. Like I was just, that was my favorite joke because the entire thing is 
the most, uh, regardless of whether you liked it, it is so clearly a drag queen, gay, you know, fantasy film. And then to dedicate it to Jerry Falwell was just... Yeah, he, he died that year. I, I, it makes me so happy. Yeah. It makes me so happy. I, I, I think I that was like an after effect. But I like probably. to think, I like to think that uh, uh, RuPaul just made this film just like as like a hate film to him you know it was like a, would have liked to think that, that, I, that RuPaul sent an actual bouquet of star booty dvds mm-hmm. you know to Falwell's uh uh funeral yeah so so mandy i haven't I haven't touched on any <laughs> impersonations but i i know that you were deeply scarred uh by sharing this film with another person but i hear that it strengthened your friendship is that the case it did so yeah so i um we're just like oh drag queen movies awesome i have a bunch of friends that love drag queens love rupaul like we haven't been able to go out and do any kind of drag shows this year um let me invite a couple people to join me so i did um and through like you know crazy scheduling and young kids stuff um only one of them was able to join me this person happens to be one of my coworkers, and i'm like all right well um, you were just going to come on because this is what I was doing tonight. We haven't hung out for a while. But I guess we'll just keep, we'll just watch it because I have to do this anyway this week. Um, not that you like drag queens or whatever. Um, so we start watching the movie and then like that first penis pops up, literally. And I was like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. I did not get a content warning of dick. And there were just so many of them. But it was totally fine. She's seen a few things in her life. And we're friends outside of work is, you know, I still have a job. Um, HR has not been notified. <laughs> yeah. She, she came to my house on Sunday and pulled some poison ivy. She's an amazing, amazing human being. And she, um, she was there with me through all of Star Booty. So. RuPaul, bringing families together <laughs> since 2007. Yeah, and, and unfortunately, it really was my plan just to get you fired so you'd have a lot more time to work on the production of Colton Classic <laughs> Podcast. Uh, I'm sad that that backfired. Uh, but yeah, this this film, I, I don't think, if you're just a normal filmmaker and maybe you like watching, you know, some Herschel Gordon Lewis horror movies or Godzilla, things like that, which I personally love. But if those are what you primarily think of as like um, schlocky film and cult classics and things like that, you will be surprised by this film with the massive amounts of nudity and sexual humor. Um, it well surpasses anything that's that comes to a mainstream audience. And... You know, kudos for that. Um, the, the the general consensus when this film came out um, was negative, I think. I think that the people that will always like drag and get the joke and are willing to sort of put up with uh, inconsistencies um, in humor and pacing and things like that, they loved it. But they'd always love it, right? I'm one of those people. I, I'm glad I watched it. Um, but I will say that um, there is fair criticism. The worst, the meanest one I think I found was um, it called the film, and I'm pretty sure I'm quoting here, uh, a sad drag queen vanity project. There's something to be said for that because it is, I mean, there's no hiding that it's a vanity project. I mean, RuPaul wrote stars in it and it's featuring a character she created in the 80s. Of course, it's a vanity project. Um, doesn't mean it can't be entertaining. Sad, I wouldn't call it sad, but I do think that there are some elements that, I really wanted more liveliness and I would have liked to see, I would have liked to see more people having fun uh, on screen. And I don't know that it's unclear how much people were really having fun. Hopefully they were all having a great time. Um, it's clearly filmed on a shoestring, probably in a very short amount of time. There's several scenes where RuPaul's character is supposed to be there and she's not even in the shot. It's just some, it's just a, a body double with, with a big wig, um, and, which is sort of funny because I'm like, this is literally your film and you weren't even on all of the, in, in all of the scenes that you were supposed to be in. I don't know exactly how that worked out. Um, but uh, I, I don't, is it the best? No. If you enjoy drag and you want to see this side where, because a lot of times Drag Race, um, you know, it, it airs on VH1 and Logo and it is... Uh, relatively family friendly there are certain things maybe in terms and 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 gay gay jokes and penis jokes and sex jokes and straight jokes that are not appropriate but you can air it on television during the day um but there's a whole other side of drag those of us that go to shows and support the queens off off television and things we know that it is often raunchy humor very 
inappropriate. That's part of the whole deal. I mean, speaking of inappropriate, Lady Bunny's in this movie. Uh, she has a bit where uh, RuPaul has to give her oral sex and Lady Bunny has giant plastic crabs all over her crazy pubic hair. I mean, <laughs> it's that you is which I'm... Teeth. It was so funny. Yeah, I'm, and I am sure that like Lady Bunny was like, I'm only going to be in your film if I have crabs because I have crabs. I don't know if that's the case or not. Uh, it's a bad Lady Bunny impression. But I think that that's, uh, you know, that's, that's right up drag alley. And I think that it, it fit. Um, there are also a lot of, uh, in addition to the adult stars, there are a lot of classic New York drag acts in here. Um, uh, I think uh, obviously Lady Bunny, Jasmine Jimenez, and Candace Kane, as we've mentioned. Um, there's also Lahoma Van Zant plays a fellow agent. Um, she 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 might have actually I'll have to check. She might have actually been in the original um, shorts as well. Uh, but there's there's a lot of a lot of people here. Uh, Sweetie Booth, uh, plays Olestra, um, the other, the other queens who are hookers in this. I just liked seeing, uh, a cast of all gay and transgender people. That was really nice. Um, because let's face it, you could absolutely have a film of all gay and transgender people and still have everyone enjoy it. Um, and, uh, on that note, please join our Patreon at patreon.com slash cult and classic podcast. Uh, so we can actually, uh, you know, keep making these, these podcasts. That's just my little plug. I hope it wasn't obvious. Uh, you'll also, if you join the Patreon, you get to see our videos, in which case you can see how insanely bad my quarantine hair has become. Uh, it literally looks like I'm wearing a, a dead man's toupee until I brush it back. Okay. Uh, so I think on the whole, this movie is entertaining, but I think it's a party movie. Uh, I would recommend this as a film to watch with friends who, when you say you want to see some dick, they're not like, excuse me. They're like, hell yeah. Then put this movie on and you're going to have a good time. Um, Mandy, who would you recommend this film to and why? Um, I agree with you that it's a great movie to watch with friends, even if you aren't expecting it, as long as they're cool. Um, I would recommend it to people who are fans of drag. It was really fun. Um, maybe fans of like people who like uh, the telenovela style um, cinema as well, because I really enjoyed like that aspect of it. Um, I would not recommend that people who dislike uh, RuPaul's music to watch this movie mm. because it is all over the place and in the background and used like really, really like long in really long scenes, like the same song. Over, or like specifically like I think I went to sleep that night with the pussy for sale song yep. running through my head because that was like a solid seven minutes that is um, that is probably the longest stretch uh, it was and, literally on so long I was waiting for that pussy to go on clearance ah uh, uh, well and it's it's worth mentioning too um I agree that it's RuPaul's music throughout and I actually and it's pretty good for the most part. Um, I think that it fit well with the vibe. Um, it's also, it's a lot of RuPaul's music that you won't hear on Drag Race. Um, and uh, uh, the, the song Star Booty was written, like, I think for the 80s, um, uh, after the character. And that soundtrack is far more widely available than the actual film. It sort of has out surpassed the film uh, in that way. And I think that that's notable. Um, you can check it out. It's, it's good listening. And uh, it's it's a little bit more uncensored RuPaul than we're used to getting on uh, on the television programs. Although I recommend you get Wow Plus, Wow Presents Plus, uh, so you can watch the unedited content anyway. Because once you watch the Queen say "fuck" a lot, and then you watch it on TV and you hear them say a lot, it can be distracting. Jeff, who would you recommend this film to, and why? So I like to imagine this was a uh, you know made specifically for Jerry Falwell, but it, if it wasn't, <laughs> I think what it was, was RuPaul wanting to wear a lot of different outfits uh, and, you know, maybe show some penis on screen. Um, and I think actually where, when it's maybe it's most charming is when they're kind of doing like, uh, you know, the outfit change montage or something yeah. like that. Um, and, you know, so I, I think you're, you're absolutely right. If you like drag and you like that, that that kind of uh, style of fun then you should watch this film i think you'll 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 at least find little bits of it that you like um but yeah 
do it in a party. I, I, I don't think that this movie is a, a solo watch. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's because it's that type of humor that it's like, what the fuck? Uh, look at the person and say, what the fuck? And then you have a good time with it. Uh, rather than laughing at the actual joke, because like they said earlier, they didn't land in a lot of cases. Yeah, I think that's spot on. And I know we usually end a segment on a movie with that question, but uh, I did want to touch on what I always find hilarious, which is um, the uh, the gay drag referrals to vaginas and female genitalia and how it's it's so funny. It's because it's off, like at one point, I think Rue's script um, calls someone's clitoris a tight clitoris which i don't even know how you would how that would be a thing um i mean <laughs> i don't that's not something men look for that's not something people describe nothing goes into the clitoris i don't really understand how it's tight but that was it was that kind of thing and i think it was used multiple times it was, yeah I think it, was, it was like a common <laughs> thing like it was a and they're and they're aware of it i'm sure because it's intentionally like vocalized but it is funny to hear and there's a full on vagina removal and transplant in this film. Um, and I don't know if he used a pork chop or what, what sort of plastic, I, I don't know what that was that they removed. Um, but it was, I mean, that's the kind of humor you're looking at. And I, if you're listening to this podcast, it's probably right up your alley. I would say, give it a watch. Um, but don't be surprised that you are not getting uh, an eighth grade health class lesson. Uh, mm. Or maybe you are, I don't know where you went to school. I mean, I'm sure Kentucky would be right on board with that. Yeah, the sloppy, you know, raw meat and yeah. the, you know, the bush with crabs in it. Uh, I think RuPaul is uh, making a clear statement that he's uh, not a fan of uh, of of the vagina. Would be my I, you know, what? I think I think RuPaul probably loves the vagina uh, as opposed to <laughs> you know, but I think maybe in a different way uh, than, <laughs> okay. than other people. And I think, I mean. If you watch this movie and you don't come out of it thinking you want Lady Bunny saying uh, beef curtains over and over again as your ringtone, I don't know what you're doing with your life. I don't know what you're doing. Um, and the other thing I will say, and I'm going to read this, uh, Candace Kane is a, 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 an excellent choreographer, and that's like one of her, her claims to fame. And I don't know, she has a little dance scene in this, but the RuPaul and other, uh, the, the Star Booty and other prostitutes dance scene uh, did, I don't know what happened. As we say in Rocky, uh, that's when the choreographer died. That dance scene, wow, that was uh, that was that was that would not. That's a season seven dance. No one wants to see a season seven dance uh, except for Katya. That was rough. Um, but again, fun time. Give it a watch, and uh, we're going to talk about a different kind of drag movie. You know what? I lied. There's one more thing I want to discuss about Star Booty before we move on to All About Evil. And it, 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 I'm going to tell a story and it's going to relate, I promise. Um, it's not just for my own self-gratification, but Jeff will remember this, I think. Uh, back in high school, where Jeff and I and our uh, other contributor who isn't with us today, Tad Mastroni, went to school, uh, we, and by we, I mean I mostly, was like, we're going to make a zombie movie because I love zombies. That's my favorite kind. And we're going to do this. And, uh, and I set out to do like this really overly ambitious project. Uh, I had a great camera. And uh, we we're like, we're going to make this movie. And it was called Zombie Dance. And it was a zombie comedy in which uh, there, it would end with a, a zo everyone being a zombie in the world and it becomes a utopia. And there would be a, a song sort of like, it's a small world after all at the end. Now, my brilliant plan was, is I don't have the time to write the whole thing myself. Uh, so I'm going to give my friends, who of course will want to be involved, several chapters or several scenes to write themselves. Now, this is what's called uh, overreach of friendship. You really can't ask people, uh, and as a podcaster, I'm still doing it. You really can't ask people to offer their time and energy in something that's really your thing and not everyone wants to be a part of. Um, so, but we did this uh, and it did not go well. Tad uh, did not turn in his scenes. Uh, most people didn't, to be fair. It wasn't singling out Tad for this. But the difference was, is that Tad was using this film as his senior project, which we all needed to complete one in order to graduate. So uh, I basically was annoyed and was like, no, there's nothing, I'm not, I'm not gonna do this. So at the last minute, Tab got another one of our friends, Tim Archer. Tim, how you doing out there? Uh, 
to to be in this zombie film, which was he still called Zombie Dance. And the film, unfortunately, it is now lost. And I'm so sad. I hope it comes back someday. But uh, it was it was reminiscent of Star Booty in many ways. Like I feel like RuPaul reached forward and said, "All these people, hey, come do this," and probably reached a little, pushed a little too hard, and got some people being like, oh, "I can't believe I did this." This is going to be another six hours. Are you kidding me? And I think some of that frustration came out on screen and made it feel a little wonky. Uh, side note, the one thing that everybody remembers about Tad Mastroianni's zombie dance clips, because it wasn't a complete film, is uh, a line that Tim Archer ad-libbed as he was being murdered by zombies, which ended up being the best take. And so Tad used it. And it ends the clips, which is uh, an above shot of Tim spread out on the ground, who's a big guy, spread out on the ground while, while zombies are reaching in at him. And he just yells to the camera, I must retain my memories so I don't become gay again. That's all I remember. It had nothing to do with the plot. And Tad presented that as his senior project. And I can tell you that uh, because we were in New Hampshire and there were, I'm sure, no gay people in the room, uh, that passed him and he passed with that. So I think that legacy needs to go out that Tad passed high school with uh, a strange, potentially uh, sexual identity insensitive quote from another person in a zombie movie. That's just it's here and there, but that was the quality of Star Booty. And again, watchable, totally watchable. Uh, but sort of watchable in the way a train wreck is watchable as opposed to the way that some like beautiful uh, ethereal majesty is watchable. Do you remember that, Jeff? Uh, hardly. I'm, 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 I'm glad to, to go back memory down memory lane here. Uh, you know, I, I, you, you know me, like my memory is shit. Like you, you tell me about people that I, I forgot about all the time. It takes about an hour of you describing who they are for me to be like, oh yeah, I remember that person. There was one scene I really liked in the original script that we never did, which is sad, uh, where the two zombies, uh, their friends, Jeff, I believe you were one of them, right? Probably. I can't remember. Uh, mm. were, uh, they, they were just playing around in the, in the snow, learning that being a zombie wasn't so bad. And uh, one of the characters, uh, which I believe was me, pees his name in the snow in cursive, and then looks to, to Jeff's character, and Jeff pees his name in the snow and then they both look concerned because it's blood. And uh, that's a gruesome scene that I, one day we will film that, Jeff. Uh, we will film the blood pee pee scene. All right. oh, I can't wait. <laughs> I go to bed every night just being like, well, we never got to film that scene and it's killing me. All right, we're gonna move on to our next movie. I am super, super, super excited about this film. Uh, it is all about evil, uh, which is written and directed by uh, Joshua Grinnell, who you will probably know, and most people know as the legendary San Francisco drag queen, Peaches Christ. Uh, All About Evil came out in 2010. Um, this is one of my favorite films of the modern era. And uh, we're going to go into a quick summary. It's, it's pretty easy to summarize, I think. Um, there is a young girl who has a mean mother and a father who wants her to be a star. Um, she grows up. Uh, being a very mousy librarian. After her father dies, she takes over the uh, movie theater that he uh, ran and was sort of his, his entire life. And uh, she ends up killing her mom on security camera in the theater when her mom wants to sell the property and accidentally playing that uh, as a short film before one of her nightly horror movie screenings. And everyone thinks it's a short film and loves it. And she begins killing people uh, and videotaping it in creative ways as short films, telling people to silence their cell phone and shut the fuck up before the movie. Uh, so these are little short films with messages. And she does this and becomes super successful. But a uh, longtime uh, patron, Thomas Decker, high school student, lover of, uh, of, his name is Steven in the movie, lover of horror films and uh, guy crushing on uh, Deb, the uh, hostess. It realizes that these are actually not uh, fake movies. They are real movies. And at which point, uh, Deborah, as she now calls herself with her inflated ego from all this uh, local success, then decides that he has to die. And, and her final performance is a full-length film where she kills the entire audience. At least that's her plan. 
this is a this is a super cool movie. A very strong homage to um, the sort of gore greats, uh, Herschel Gordon Lewis, um, Ted V. Mickle, who Peaches Christ is actually in one of his sequels to Astro Zombies. I believe it's Astro Zombies M3, which is the third one. And uh, uh, I can't wait to talk about this film. So, Mandy, what what did you expect from this film going into it after watching Star Booty? Oh well, I expected it to be like more like star booty i guess like lower production value not knowing anything um about josh's work uh you know but having some idea of the cast i was like oh it's just gonna be another low budget kind of like campy like weird thing a lot more drag queens featured in it either in um, cameos or starring roles uh it'll be fun uh, i really want to see like what drag horror looks like and then my expectations were completely blown because i fell deeply in love with this movie. Um, even to the point of just like, oh, life is imitating art. Where like, I'm like, oh, Jesus Christ, I love you. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm your biggest fan now. No, it, was, it was so good. Yeah, I think that was a lot of, cause I didn't know, I first saw this film um, when it debuted at the LA Film Festival. Uh, my, my wife, Grin, took me there uh, and I got to meet Joshua. Uh, he did a fun talk there. Um, and we watched the movie, and I too was blown away. Um, I just watched the last exorcism uh, that Ellie Roth produced, uh, the the uh, fake documentary exorcism film, which is a great film. Uh, coming off of that sort of highbrow horror film, and then hearing that oh, Drag Queen Peaches Christ film is is premiering, I didn't know what to expect, but I did think that it would probably be lower budget. But uh, this is a this is a slick film. Um, it's everything is done very well from a technical standpoint. And Joshua. Uh, is he went to Penn State? He's a film uh, filmmaker, and there's a lot of short films online you can find. But this this by far surpasses, uh, which I think is what you're getting at, what we would assume to be camp film. Into it is very camp, and it's definitely an homage, but it's also a very strong film. The technical side of everything, the directing, the shots, the cast he he assembled is is fantastic. Um, Jeff, what was your uh, same question? What was your impression going into this film after Star Booty? Uh, well, I, yeah, I, I didn't really expect much from it. I, I thought I was going to not like it. I didn't think it was going to be very good. Um, and, and maybe, you know, maybe that's some, you know, uh, mistakes and some prejudice or, you know, just some laden, you know, ignorance, you know, you disgust me, it, you know, I, I don't know what it was. <laughs> I, didn't, I just didn't expect much. I thought it was going to be, you know, really low budget, like really, uh, like, you know, uh, maybe um like very gory but but not much uh, intelligence to it and that that was the exact opposite it, it it was it was a very very smart like brilliantly written script um and really an expertly crafted film um and i'm kind of pissed i didn't know about it until you know last week yeah, so so uh full disclosure i'm very excited uh next week's episode will be an interview with Joshua Grenell, uh, better known as the one and only Peaches Christ. I'm super excited to bring this to you guys. Uh, Joshua slash Peaches is a fantastic uh, ally of, of cinema and really, really interesting person. And it's sort of a shame for the rest of us that don't dwell in San Francisco that Peaches tends to stay in San Francisco. She does tour, but she is a an icon in San Francisco. She uh, became really well known by doing a midnight horror show where they'd have a stage show related to a movie and then play that movie. Uh, and, and she did this many years and, and is still doing things. Um, she works with and is friends with some of the most amazing talent to come out of RuPaul's Drag Race, which you know means the most amazing talent from a lot of drag scenes, including Jinx Monsoon, uh, Ben de la Creme. She works with a lot. In fact, before this uh, horrendous pandemic from Miss Rona, they were going to uh, do a... Uh, um, a show uh, they've done several before death becomes her uh, drag becomes her things like that uh, that pushed off to 2021 um, but really excited definitely listen um, also I will say there will be slight spoilers for this film um, I don't think anything ruins this movie because this movie is really solid from top to bottom in my opinion uh, but if you think you're gonna watch this movie uh, watch it first um, I will say this I did read Peaches for not having the film currently available at peacheschrist.com. 
uh, that, uh, they, that he assured me will be up. Joshua said, we're going through the inventory. Also, even more exciting, they're working to bring All About Evil to streaming soon. So uh, that will be available soon. And I, I, for one, will watch it all the time. It's, it's an absolutely genius film. Um, but enough gushing about it. I'm going to talk about it. Uh, the cast, like I said, I think is a stellar cast. Um, first and foremost, I mentioned Thomas Decker. He plays Stephen, the, the young student uh, who, who loves the Victoria Theater, which is the theater in here. And, uh, and I think he's probably most well known for um, playing John Connor in the Terminator TV show, The Sarah Connor Chronicles, uh, which was a, a pretty solid TV show. He did a great job. He does a really great job in this. Um, he, he brings an honesty to this character that I actually really identified with. So, uh, he wants to be, uh, an art student. So he wants to go to college for, he wants to do animation and he's obsessed with these old horror movies. Uh, and, and the Victoria is like his refuge and he develops a crush on Deb, uh, as she becomes Deborah, uh, and, and, uh, and sort of gains confidence and a little bit of crazy. And there's one in particular, there's a scene uh, which we'll play a clip from where Josh has been drawing all through class and he draws zombies and things like that. And uh, the teacher forces him to stay after and has this discussion with him. Let's take a listen. You're a smart boy, Stephen. And creative, too. I respect you. But you've given me cause for concern. Okay, but I've already told you I'm really fine. You can say you're fine until you're blue in the face, mister. It doesn't mean I buy it. Mrs. Moorhead, I, I, I don't really see how my personality is any of your business. The safety of me and my class is entirely my business. Perhaps if Mary Manson's high school English teacher had made his cries for help her business, the whole Columbine tragedy you're so interested in never would have happened. So <laughs> this is actually a very funny scene, even though it's because she's saying, she says, so she's essentially blaming Columbine on Marilyn Manson, number one, and then thinking that his name is Mary. Uh, and that's why she says if Mary Manson's teacher had listened, uh, maybe they would have avoided Columbine. There's a whole lot to unpack there. Um, this actually happened to me uh, in, in our school, Jeff uh, and Mandy. Uh, I actually, yeah, uh, our psychology teacher, our psychology teacher there uh, saw that I had drawn some robot with a gun on the back of a, a, a one of my tests and went to uh, the school counselor uh, concerned about me, and uh, which is a weird thing. And for, in my case, it ended fairly easily because uh, she was actually my neighbor and had been my neighbor for many years. And we just said, well, and she goes, oh, no, that's just Nathan. That's just Nathan. He's fine, which is, is funny um, because I'm glad that she knew that. But also the thought is, but yeah, wave it off. But I also thought it was crazy that the psychology teacher was concerned. And, and that's how we went about it. I don't know. Maybe that's the right thing to do. But I certainly felt for Steven's character in this, because I do think, and he talks about this with his mother played by the amazing Cassandra Peterson, who is better known as Elvira, has been my like fantasy person from day one. I, ever since I first saw Elvira on TV, uh, my family and I watched her and, and she's super amazing. And watching her um, play this character's mother, fantastic. But yeah, this happened to me. It's a weird thing. Uh, it's a weird thing. It also happened uh, at the school I went to before, again, for drawing macabre things. I like how uh, Joshua wrote this line, how Thomas delivered it. I don't think my personality is any of your business. Like, because that is really what it comes down to, right? Like that difficulty that people have separating um, someone's, someone's interests from uh, action. You know, most of us who watch horror films do not murder people on the weekend. You know, I don't know when we would have time to murder people because I'm too busy watching horror films for this podcast. So, I mean, I don't even see how those two things go together. But it was an interesting scene. And I think Thomas Decker does a really good job. I don't know. What were your guys' thoughts on that whole relationship between the teacher, Miss Moorhead, who's uh, played? I don't know that she's been in anything else. Uh, I don't know. Her, her name is Gwyneth Richards. She does a good job in this role. Um, but I couldn't find anything else on her. But, yeah, what was your take on this? I thought it was one of the more heavy handed elements of, mm -hmm. of the movie. I, I mean, there's definitely like, you know, there's, there's one side of it, you know, people in crisis, you know, maybe need, you know, uh, 
some help, finding help. Uh, but then there's also uh, maybe teachers, and even psychology teachers are, are maybe not trained to detect those types of things or like actually find the actual warning signs. And so they just attribute it to, you know, random things like, uh, you know, pictures people draw or the movies that they're interested in um, rather than, you know, actual uh, you know, clinical kind of uh, signals or whatever. Um, I, I also, I'm not well-trained, so I'm not going to speak to it in, in, in that sense. But I, I, I think that that's, that was kind of the thing that I took away is it was like, I don't know what specifically he was trying to say is like, you know, teachers just leave the kids alone or uh, if he was, yeah, I, I, you know what I mean? It I, is an I, interesting question to ask though, because people are really concerned about him, right? Yet Deborah clearly has issues and actually needs help. Yeah, well, the policeman was, though. Like, I, I think the policeman right. was just like, yeah, leave this kid alone. Yeah. Um, he's like, there's nothing, like, and not even saying that he didn't do anything. Uh, like, when it comes up, one of his classmates that he was on a date with goes missing because she's the newest star of one of Deborah's shorts, actually her feature. Um, and I thought that that was interesting because Deborah does, I mean, and again, these are these are definite elements of these era of movies that, that uh, Joshua Grinnell is, is uh, sort of emulating and homaging, right? The whole, like, uh, Deborah has a bad childhood in a way. Her father is very sweet to her, but her so mother is... demanding kind of in a way. Too. Yeah, like, here, get on the stage. People make fun of you, clearly, but I want you to stand up in front and sing this, which is very attached to him. And her mother is just a horrible bitch, right? Like, she's just oh, a monster. nasty, nasty lady. Yeah. And her mother uh, is, again, this cast is phenomenal. Her mother uh, is, is, is uh, this tall beautiful actress uh, julie caitlin brown who's been in many things but she towers over uh natasha leone we haven't even talked about natasha leone yet playing deborah natasha leone is hands down one of my all-time favorite actresses and one of the best actresses working i think listeners will most likely know her at this point from orange is the new black where she played nikki uh through all the seasons um but she also i mean she was in uh, uh, Slums of Beverly Hills is another great one. She's been acting solidly since she was a child. She was in Blade Trinity, Die, Mommy, Die. She's been, uh, she, her first, I don't know if it was, it's actually, this wasn't her first role, but one of her first roles is she actually played one of the kids, Opal, in several episodes of Pee Wee's Playhouse. And I feel like that was perfect because that really set up all of the oddball characters that she would be playing for her career. Uh, Russian Doll. Uh, watch that series on Netflix, um, the second season, somewhere down the line. Uh, really fantastic. She's, uh, and she was Joshua's uh, 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 sort of dream character actress for this. And she does a great job. Um, she really delivers her lines sort of in a way like RuPaul. It's a different character, but she's intentionally hammy. And that's sort of the whole gist of that character, right? She wanted, her dad wanted her to be a star. And now she's finally a star, but she really doesn't have that subtlety or nuance that most stars would have. But in the films that they're emulating, the stars were ham-fisted, you know, and over the top. So there's a lot, lot to unpack there. Mandy, when you watch the film uh, as the token woman on this podcast uh, at the moment, there's this interesting play um, between these horror movies being aware that they uh, victimize women in some way, they portray it as exploitation of women, but also the fact that the character who's murdering people in the film is a woman and is making and they, they seem to play with that. I don't think they ever answer the question of what's right or wrong. They just sort of approach it as, well, she's a female filmmaker exploring this, this avenue. Isn't that something... Isn't that something remarkable? But also like, yeah, but they're really nasty to women. What was your take on that whole mini monologue? I, I really liked it. And like so much of this movie is really smart. And as you've mentioned already many times, there's a lot to unpack in almost every scene. Um, I really did like that, like how they're just like, oh, well, she's a female filmmaker. You know, isn't that great? <laughs> like, isn't that kind of good enough? Like she's doing her thing and we shouldn't really question it or like look too closely at it. Um, you could, I don't know, like it, it was just, I liked just how crazy she was and how like, like you said, like how hammy it was. It was like almost like she was, 
at the beginning, I was a little confused about if the hand was acting in her like normal life. Mm-hmm. And I, I kind of got it as the movie went on. Yeah. Like, oh, this is very intentional. Um, you know, it kind of shows the evolution of the character herself, like almost playing a role as herself that her dad wanted to be an actress. And like, I don't know, it was, I really liked that part about it. She didn't really give much thought to the whole exploitation of women in horror films, like mainstream horror films, which is very much a thing, um, versus how it was done here. It did not feel like split, like it didn't feel like there was any exploitation in this film, the way it was, even though there's like literally like breasts, like, <laughs> like female body parts. Yeah. Um, being dismembered um i was more focused on the fact that they were making like a play on words of the title of a famous right. book right and all of, and, like, all of the films are played because she's a, she starts out as a librarian, a librarian. being a film and, and every really film like that, <laughs> yeah like i really like that continuity of character and she's mm-hmm. still like very much the librarian or like that was her source material because that's what she knew and like you said you can really unpack it like you can go back and start to theorize um you know, her character, because the film opens with this as her as a little girl singing about a movie thing in front of all these kids at this kid's matinee, and she already clearly is an outcast. They're making fun of her as she's up there. And then because of nervousness, she pees, but continues to sing. And her mother's laughing, cackling at her when she's dressed as the witch, the Wicked Witch of the West. Um, it's just, it's this, it's this really strong sort of, um, uh, I mean, I, I think the obvious one is an homage to Carrie, right? Either when she gets doused with blood on stage or when she uh, has her first period in the bathroom at school. You know what I mean? Like those sort of the, the, the embarrassment moments that set the character up as like, oh, this character is deeply damaged because of her surroundings. Uh, you know, like maybe she was a little different to begin with, but now this is what's happened. And we get that. And then the next scene is, uh, is Debbie as an adult uh, leaving the uh, library with another librarian who is uh, Mink Stoll. And Mink Stoll is a super well-known actress for John Waters films, one of John Waters' regulars. Uh, And she has a great little role in this as well. But she's like, hey, you know, you need to get out there. I want to help you. Like, you you just need to be out there. And of course, she's very mousy. Until she commits her first murder, she doesn't have the strength to sort of be her own person, right? It's kind of what it feels like. Um, and, And I guess... It's interesting to see these characters because both uh, Deborah and Stephen have these outside forces that are kind of working against them, right? I think one of the big differences, if you're to analyze it in this way, is that Deborah, we don't see her having any cheerleaders that help her out in her life, right? Stephen has friends. He has uh, Judy, who maybe there's some, some, some romance tension in there, um, and she has uh, other friends. Uh, Lolita, who's uh, played by Ashley Fink, who is in uh, uh, gl- who is in Glee as well, um, and Jean, I think, is Anthony Fitzgerald. So it's like he has these people, and of course, his mom, even though she overreacts sometimes, or or maybe maybe she doesn't, depending on how you feel about parenting. Uh, she, he has these support structures in his life, whereas Deborah clearly didn't. And the difference in the outcome, then you can make an argument is very clear, right? she becomes deranged and builds her own family of maniacs. And he rejects the sort of reality of horror in favor of just the fake horror on screen. And so I wonder, that's an interesting play that I think you could really, you could do an entire episode on. Um, But it's sort of like, even though they both have detractors like uh, Thomas with his, uh, Stephen's character, the character Stephen with his teacher, Mrs. Moorhead, who is really like, uh, if you think of the movie Elvira, Mistress of the Dark, um, it reminded me of, uh, what was her name? Oh, Edie McClurg's chastity pariah character, who's like, you know, the, the super like prim and proper, who's actually just a bitch, even though she's like, I'm the best of the town, everybody should be like me. Uh, and our, our Patreon viewers are lucky enough to watch the videos, will know that uh, Mandy has disappeared into an insane blur because Zoom does not know what a person looks like. I just flipped from my background to me. <laughs> yeah, it's great. It's fantastic. But so what the thing we haven't talked about in here, um, Mandy, you mentioned the short films that uh, Deborah makes, and they're all these clever plays on on famous book titles, um, Slasher in the Rye, uh, A Tale of Two Severed Titties, um, and uh, and the oh my favorite is the one that it's a poster that plays in the credits the diary of anne frankenstein 
Um, they're, they're crazy, right? These films, and they're really just little snuff films, right? In the movie world. Um, well, there's what, the, the something of the shrew? Uh, the maiming of the shrew. The maiming of the shrew, yeah. Yep. And, that's, and these scenes are, they're really gory, right? There's good makeup effects in this. The Tale of Two Titties is the one that I always grimace at. Um, because it's it's uh, they're trying to to kill this this movie patron uh, who just moved to the area by putting her head in a guillotine, but of course it doesn't fit. So they get the idea to just put her breasts in one at a time, and it's so disgusting. And I like that you see the audience react. Like it was a brilliant way to bring I think everyone on board, even people who may not be comfortable with gore films, sort of bring them on board. They show it, and you're like, oh, but then it shows the audience, and the entire audience is like. Oh, you know, like everyone's in it together. Um, and, and speaking of which, the, the character of uh, Veronica, who is uh, maimed so horribly in this way, uh, is actually uh, another great actress. Um, and she was in Inland Empire by David Lynch. So uh, she, she's continued on to do great things. Um, Mink Stoll's film, her snuff film that she is in in this, is The Maiming of the Shrew one. And that's the one that got uh, Corinne, my wife, is when. Uh, her lips are sewn shut. That's such a visceral thing. Uh, and then what's worse is she's put with all the bodies that they're accumulating after every film in the attic of the theater. And her lips, she tears her mouth open to scream. That's the one that is, that's tough to overcome if you're squeamish, because that is just, it reminded me of a, uh, a film that, that uh, we'll, we'll do at some point on this podcast, Goodnight Mommy. You know, there's a super glue film tearing open, but the stitches. I don't know if that got an, either of you guys. Like, what was your take on the 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 graphic violence in this film? I thought it was funny <laughs> most of it. Um, I think yeah, I'm actually because of the context of like I don't know and her and Deborah's ridiculous acting and costumes and everything and like just the whole scenario just being so outlandish. Like, I found it actually kind of funny. Um, and also, like, when she's, like, ripping the stitches and, like, screaming, isn't it playing downstairs? So yes. Like, mm-hmm. Also, her screaming, like, with the movie playback. Over her I own, the scene was, of her own maiming, yeah. I thought that that was very clever writing. Yeah, and and I think, and like you said, the this is definitely a dark comedy. Like, it is a horror film, but it is also... I've, there are moments that are very funny. Um, in fact, uh, I'll, I'll play this one clip. This is from the end. So uh, it's sort of this inglorious bastards moment, right? The theater's on fire and uh, everyone is sort of dispersing. You know, Deborah has tried to kill everyone as her feature film is playing on the big screen. And Deborah, uh, Stephen has ruined sort of part of her plan and she grabs his mom, Cassandra Peterson's character, and goes to the roof and they're on this roof. and. She's got his mom with a knife, uh, and he starts yelling at her, and this is that scene. You know, I said I did it all for you, okay? Pathetic. Mr. Tennis has you for a legacy? You're not even directing people. And you know what? You're a terrible actress. You're nothing. There is no magic. Shut up, Steven! Just shut up! Look! So here's there's a backstory to this scene that I absolutely love that I remember uh, Joshua Grinnell said during the screening at the LA Film Fest. I think it's also in the uh, uh, commentary if you're lucky enough to catch the DVD. And so in that scene, uh, Cassandra Peterson, uh, Elvira, the mom, breaks free and runs to Stevens, you know, Thomas Decker's character, and Deborah loses it, right? And Natasha Leone clearly screams and loses it, uh, and she ends up falling over the, or getting stabbed and pushed over the building. Well, in the scene, it, you can hear uh, Cassandra Peterson scream, you're a terrible person, you're crap. And the original script said, I guess, you're shit. But Cassandra Peterson, who is totally fine saying the word shit, was like, that's not what my character would say. This mom would not say that. She's so improper. Like, she would, the worst she would be is like, you know, you're crap. And, and that was how the line got changed. And I just love, uh, it's also, I think, a sign of a, a great filmmaker when you take that 
idea, you know? Because uh, Andrea Peterson is no stranger to playing a character. She's played uh, the same character for 30 years, right, of Elvira. She knows how to get into a character. And when someone like that says, this isn't right for this character, if you don't listen to that, you run the risk of the audience catching it when you didn't catch it, you know? Um, and this film, everyone stays in their their character's sort of role, I think, really well. And I think that's a, excellent directing and also excellent casting. Um, there's also, I don't know if anybody else, there's this really sweet sort of, like, love between, uh, like, like non-sexual love between Steven's character and Deborah's character, right? Because he has a crush on her, which we totally get. Like, she's obviously older than him. There's this great scene when he's in his room and Cassandra Peterson comes in and he's got posters all over. And he's like, mom, I think I might have a crush on an older woman. And she looks above his bed and there's a poster of her as Elvira in like a really skimpy bathing suit. And she just goes, how much older? And it's this hilarious inside joke. And I, I, I actually absolutely, didn't catch that. I've got oh, that. it's, I loved it. And it's, and it's a really great, it's one of those things that's so good. It worked both in the scene, but also from a meta level, right? Um, but he has this crush on her until he finds out she's crazy. Um, and she seems to sort of reciprocate in a way, like she always acknowledges him, even though she's completely in her own world. And, um, and even sort of offers him maybe a future job at some point, uh, when he asks about it. And at the end, even when he's saying these mean things to her to get her to let her mom go, um, she's, she doesn't, she doesn't insult him, right? Like, she's like, stop, Steven. She's still calling him his full name, all this stuff. And it's sort of this really almost sad breakdown, right? Because I do think she's kind of a tragic character. Um, she's killed a lot of people. Uh, but it's this tragic character. And then after she's fallen off the building, when everything is resolved, um, she's on top of, and the, and the mean teacher has been sprayed with her blood, which is a lovely comeuppance. Um, Steven walks by with his mom and his friend Judy, who he's just rescued, uh, and sees Deborah's dead body on top of his car, and the coroner, or whoever it is, uh, is, is messing with the body, and her head falls to the side, and her eyes shift, and Steven just kind of looks at her, and it's like, it's a look of sadness to me, right? It doesn't look like disgust, like, ugh, you know, it's like, it really, they really seem to have this connection, and I thought that that was a really nice nuance, because they seem like parallels in so many ways that have just veered so violently apart. I don't know if anybody else in, got that. Even, even in that scene on the rooftop, um, like basically uh, Steven realized that there was like no kind of like rational discussion mm -hmm. um, with Deborah. So he, he clearly has basically a read on her kind of emotional state and like what buttons to press. Mm -hmm. And, he, you know, who's basically a character who's a very kind character uh, who wouldn't necessarily, you know, go on an angry rant at somebody, at least as far as we saw in this film, uh, you know, is basically using this cruelty and, and malice that he knows is going to trigger her uh, to, to basically like break her down so that he can save his mother. Um, I thought that that kind of was like a nice version to that, uh, that dynamic between the two. It was like, like, I know you, I know where your buttons are. I know how to push them. Um, and, uh, you know, like nobody, clearly nobody else did. Right. Like it wasn't mm -hmm. like nobody else saw her that way. And there's just like, uh, her character in, in that, in that manner. Um, to anyway, totally. Yeah. I think, and that is, and he really is playing that part, right? He's like, you're not a good actress, and she kind of isn't, right? That's part of the point. But also, he's not really even that great an actor, right? Like, we know he's not telling the truth, but um, at least not in how he says, but uh, Natasha Leone's character, Deborah, is, is, that's clearly what she's felt her whole life from what she's been told by her mom or whatever, right? Like, she's nothing. Like, in the beginning, we see it, right? Her mom literally says before she's killed, like, you're not a star, you're a loser. Um, and so to, to have that sort of come back, and it's a classic way to, to defeat the crazy person, right? Like we see that in movies all the time, like, um, you know, talk them on the ledge. It's like, and it can be super hammy. And in this case, it sort of works for it in that way, right? It's a little hammy, but it also, it, it brings that humanity to the character that has sort of gone so far off the rails that now she's like, I'm a star. You know what I mean? Like she has 
but we haven't got into her little family that she puts together, right? Like she has this little tryst with like the ancient projectionist, Mr. Twiggs, who is, is played by super legendary uh, uh, actor that we lost in 2019, um, sadly, although again, he was a thousand years old, but Jack Donner. Um, Jack Donner, once you, you may not know his name, but once you see his face, uh, his tall frame, you would, you'll, you know, oh, yes, I know that guy. Um, and uh, I think it starts with him, right? He's very kind to her. He's worked at, we learn he's worked at the theater with her father for like 30 years or something. And uh, then it builds, right? Because she's like, I can't, we can't do all this. I can't sell tickets and run whatever. And he's like, maybe we should put an ad in the window. And she's like, yeah that'll that's perfect like we kill you know we kill people for movies and let's just put an ad in the window so she first looks at the paper and sees two identical twins who murdered their parents brutally at age seven like are now being released and she pretends to be their aunt and goes and collects them and it's like you know join our join our little club um and they're these like super twins from the shining kind of uh setup right and uh they're they're they are twins um Jade Ramsey and Nikita Ramsey, who are currently in, uh, they had a bit in uh, Star Trek uh, Picard, which uh, I, everybody loves Jean-Luc Picard, you know, Patrick Stewart's the man, so check them out. But they play these like psychotic, silent, very stiff, crazy twins, like you've seen in so many uh, of these movies, especially The Shining. Like they literally, it was clearly the idea that these are the two little girls from The Shining all grown up. And I loved their their parts. They just, they played it perfectly. Uh, and then you have what might be the best um, gay sidekick character, which is so funny because you'd usually have, you know, the gay sidekick in a stereotypical um, uh, uh, heteronormative movie would just be like, oh, you know, I think uh, David Rakoff called it uh, Fudgy McPacker. He's like, they only want me to play Fudgy McPacker, right? It's just this really over the top ridiculousness of a gay person. But we get it in uh, uh, the character of, um, uh, what was his name? Uh, uh, Adrian, Adrian. And Adrian is this like nasty teeth, sort of um, kind of, I got like a, a clockwork orange vibe, but really messy. And he's played by Noah Segan, who is uh, yet another great actor who's still uh, working the chart. He was in Knives Out. Um, he was in, he was one of the X wing pilots in the Star Wars: The Last Jedi. It's been all over the place, um, but he's fantastic. They find him because they watch him mug an old woman and beat her with her cane, and then take her like mink scarf or or fox scarf, whatever it is, some sort of wrap. And he's like smelling it and like clearly appreciates it. And it's so unsettling, but it, he's a hilarious character. I mean, like when she's, when Deborah's on the talk show with like the local morning news host or whatever, and uh, she pushes the other makeup artist away and does her makeup. And then the host is like, um, you, you got to clear the scene where you go. And he goes, fuck you, troll. And then, and then walks off set. Like, it's just, he's totally off, totally out of there. And I love that they put this little family together. And it's sort of like Robert Rodriguez and Tarantino do this. They give every every little character quirks and they make these characters seem so much more than 2d people because really they're so small in the whole film right they're literally there to facilitate the progression of the plot but that didn't stop uh joshua Greenham from putting um really interesting personalities um in these characters and i think he did that by taking these stereotypes like the ghostly twins and the um you know fashion forward sociopath into uh onto these people and then giving them funny lines and stuff um what were your guys' yeah, take on those of, characters one of my favorite scenes was when they were cleaning up the bathroom and they're like coming out and they've cut like a body in a trash can and they're just like trying to play it cool and <laughs> just it cracked me up yeah and they play and i love the twist because it's like because he's the door um the usher right is is mm -hmm. adrian's character is the usher and uh, the other two ushers are the twins who are like the janitorial staff and they've just killed uh steven's date and put her in the bin yeah and there's blood on her, but they're wheeling it out and they're like yeah she left she left in a cab 
Sorry. Yeah, totally yeah. left in a cab. Yeah, she's gone. Yeah, and yeah, but everything was bloody, and then they like go and like toss out the bloody mop water like in the like, right in the front, front door, yeah. <laughs> just like across the sidewalk. Just, then, it was that reminds much. me of remember t- Jeff? I don't know if you remember this in video update when Tad worked there. They throw the wop, mop water out the front, and I'm like, the handicap ramp is right there, and that's in New Hampshire where it freezes instantly in the winter, and you just have this iced up handicap ramp. I'm like, what? You're trying to kill someone. Anyway, side story. Um, but yeah, that, rem- that was reminiscent of that. Uh, and I think- Make fun of Tad more while he's not let's here. Do- we're gonna do an entire episode that just rails on Tad. Um, yeah, no, we're very, very happy that all of our friends are alive and well. And uh, yeah, that was a great scene. And you've got the, there's, there's lots of little scenes like that that are so horrible, but they're so funny. Like um, after the maiming of the shrew and they sewed Mink Stoll's mouth shut, and the whole beginning of that is they break into the library when it's closed, right? And she's closing everything up. And uh, they're like, shh, 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 like telling her to be quiet as she's like starting to panic, trapped in this room with them. And then like when Mink is upstairs in the attic alive while they're playing, you know, her maiming film underneath her and she, her mouth rips open and she screams, uh, Mr. Twiggs comes up with an ax and cuts off her head and then says, she told you to shush. Like, it's just, it's so out there. And it's so fantastic. And for drag fans, Peach's uh, Christ is in this film, as well as uh, I think Heckling is in it and a, 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 and a handful of other local San Francisco drag queens. So it's worth watching for that. They have little bit parts. Peach has a couple of lines. Um, but it is clear, and I think, Mandy, you kind of got into this too. Uh, Joshua, Goodall, he said, I remember at the uh, Los Angeles Film Festival premiere, that this isn't Peach's movie, this is my movie. Um, and I think that that's appropriate to state because this is not just a camp movie, it's a great movie with a lot of camp. Um, mm-hmm. And so I, I, I can't say enough about this. This was, when, when this podcast came up, uh, actually a couple of years ago to, to start working on it, uh, this film was uh, the absolute top of my list. So uh, to get to do it and talk to it with you guys and uh, get to interview uh, Joshua Grinnell, Peaches Christ herself, uh, is, is really phenomenal. And I think the, I, I, this is one of those movies that was paced really well for me. I didn't find that anything was particularly slow. Um, I, I don't know if you guys agree with that, but I wasn't bored in any stretch. There were no stretches where I was like, why are we seeing this? Um, and that's impressive because there are scenes that don't have to do with Deborah, right? Like we see Stephen a couple of times in the lunchroom at school and in the classroom. And it's just giving us, it's just fleshing out his character. Um, we also get a little bit of his friends too, which is kind of nice. Uh, you know, um, and, and, and also Joshua has given them all little bits uh, in that final climax when they're all trapped trying to get out of the theater. Uh, and, and, um, and one of his friends ends up stabbing Mr. Twiggs until he stops moving, which I really like that scene because he's already been bludgeoned uh, by Judy with the, with his own camera, right? And he's lying there. And then he opens his eyes and starts to get up, right? And and Steven's friend uh, is like, uh, Lolita, played by Ashley Pink, is like, no, no, not gonna happen. And like stabs him a whole bunch, you know? Like, because there's, there's always that movie. It's the scream moment, right? Like even before scream, you know, it was the Jason moment and 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 the uh, end of Nightmare on Elm Street moment, right? Like the, they're still alive or they're back. It's always that moment. And I always appreciate when a movie a horror movie like this is like nope not gonna happen mm, mm, nope yes um jeff you're gonna say something uh yeah i mean I, I i think that um the you know the like all of the characters like you said were very good um in the sense that they had depth to them um but but i i don't i go back to the same thing like i think that this is just a really like smart script like right from just yeah. like that first scene where you you kind of like you start to see it unfold right like because she accidentally hits play and i don't know how they're like actually like uh, you know like they tie their security system into their projector for some reason uh but anyways mm-hmm. it, you know it starts playing their security system you're like i see what's happening here and mm-hmm. it's just like wow this is like brilliant uh like as like the the characters in the movie that are like like you know they're kind of like hmm what's going on they're not like Oh my God! A murder is happening. Yeah. They're like they're like, huh? This is cinema. 
I'm in a movie theater and anything that is a murder that comes up is going to be film, right? And then they, yeah. you know, so you see that coming up and it's just like, like, wow, that's like absolutely brilliant. And it like, it really, uh, uh, it really builds as the film goes. The, the end was a little like chaotic and crazy, uh, but I thought it was fun at that point. Um, it it kind of like, it, you know, had surpassed its brilliance and it had to end somehow. Yep. Um, and, I, and I think that it was like super well done in that sense. And I, I knew a filmmaker who called them goodies when he's like, all these little things the audience is going to enjoy, we're tossing them in there, right? And so it's like, the movie has to end, but here's, uh, you know, Lolita's character gets to stab this guy and have a funny quip. And um, the uh, 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 Adrian is going to uh, get half of someone's torso stuck on his head. You know, like these things that are ridiculous, but they're fun to watch. And like you said, it starts to get explosive and chaotic. And then... Uh, it's smart to always remove your lead cast to a new location so they can have the impactful, clean, silent moment right on the rooftop where you just get to the, the actual um, uh, yeah, resolution. Most of these movies ended on a rooftop. It's a common, it's a common <laughs> thing. It's a common thing. Use the roof. roof. How many, how many movies have we done that ended on a rooftop? It's a non-trivial number. <laughs> yeah, no, it isn't. And you know, I wonder it, two things. One, uh, there's not much that tends to show you uh, where you are on a rooftop as far as like things you have to worry about showing. Like you don't have to blur out a whole lot. You're on a rooftop. You're also above a lot of the noise unless you got wind. So I think that there's plenty of reasons. Plus, as long as you can get to the rooftop. Good luck proving that it's your rooftop. I don't need a I don't need a filming permit. <laughs> so I don't know that that's the case here, but that is something to consider. None of the movies on this show filmed without a permit. Of course not. <laughs> Certainly not Star Booty. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. So I think I think that what we have here is uh, two movies by drag queens that are very different. Um, and I think that stems partially from the fact that not only does uh, Joshua Grinnell Peaches Christ have a film background, um, but they're both homages too, right? Like Star Booty is clearly supposed to be a black exploitation um, uh, homage, and All About Evil uh, is a, an homage to films of the past, especially the the drive-in films, you know. Um, uh, and William Castle films, you know, where they would have gimmicks in the lobby, things like that. And I, I think that they both work on that way, but All About Evil, Star Booty is for a very targeted audience. All About Evil, really, for anyone who can stomach some gore, it's a great film, and I think it's a lot of fun. And even though it is graphic, it's done in such a way, I think, Mandy, you mentioned this, that I'm going with it. Like, this is a fun film. Um, the tone is never... It's never overtly malicious in feeling, which is sort of, I think... Um, what a lot of the draw is to those movies of the past, you know, um, William Marshall and, and, and uh, uh, Herschel Gordon Lewis and things. It's like, you watch these movies and terrible things are happening on screen, but I'm not really offended. I'm not really that bothered. It's just, it feels like fun. Like, um, I don't think that this person is really in danger and I don't think they're really in danger or feel that way. Whereas uh, uh, some films in contemporary horror really want to make you feel disturbed it's real yeah yeah um and i see somebody in danger and they're trying to invoke that like panic and you know empathy for like somebody's you know it, situation or whatever and i think that this film has a really all about evil it has tension especially in the early middle parts right like I, I was on pins and needles even though i'd seen it before watching it again like when uh, Debrula kills her mother and then is panicking, right? Like you're like, and when they kill um, the the obnoxious snooty high school girl in the bathroom, like how are they going to get away with this, right? You're like, you're you're a little panicked, and it's just a little tense, and that's that's expert filmmaking to me is when you can make me feel tense. You know, when I have tension, then you sold me, and I'm living it, and that that works for me. So we're gonna get down to it, Mandy. Who would you recommend All About Evil 2 and why? If you like movies like Cabin in the Woods, uh, you'll like this movie a lot. Uh, so yeah, check it out. Um, again, it might be like a watch party kind of movie. I watched it on my own and really enjoyed it, but it might be something that'd be fun to watch with other people because there's definitely stuff to react to um, and enjoy um, with someone else and laugh about. Uh, 
Yeah, oh, really, really good one. I love it. And, uh, and I think it's true. It also is a good party movie. The difference is, is Star Booty is a party movie where everyone would be laughing and have a good time and All About Evil is a party movie where we'd be like, shut up, shut up. You're going to miss it. Shut up. Yeah. Jeff. And look, uh, you have some, some friend like we do that, that just can't appreciate it and they're talking through the whole thing about how it's not good and you get furious with them. We've had, we've had that experience several times in high school. But anyways, um, the, uh, yeah, the, I guess the 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 genre of this film is i mean it's a horror but it's like maybe a little bit closer to comedy horror but not quite i I don't know it's like it's more like a like a thinking it's like more of like an intellectual horror film to me um on kind of the the narrative but then it also is you know it it really does have a lot of kind of like fun like like i don't even know how to describe it because people are getting murdered but it is it's fun i don't know the i don't know the right like series of words to to describe that that's complicated because it's Deborah is clearly like a flawed and troubled character, but she's also ridiculous. Yeah, and I think that Joshua really walked the line really well with that and how it was written. Like it shows both, and so that makes it fun, but it almost also makes it real. Yeah, like you can empathize, but you're also laughing. I think it's a really hard thing to get right. I think yeah. also just like the continuity of the writing from beginning to end like the mirroring of that first scene that Nate was talking about where like they're in the auditorium and everyone's laughing at them singing but at the end they're also laughing at her or laughing at Stephen in the same theater it was just a nice mirror from the beginning to the end which I think is like probably like a classic writing tool yeah um and then like the thread of the teacher giving Stephen a hard time like there's at least three scenes with that that go through and there's a progression in the development of that subplot like it's just very clean very good yeah i mean i guess like like a lot of like stephen king's writing um like we mentioned carrie earlier uh tends to be like is you know obviously he's a famous horror writer but a lot of his stuff is very intellectual like it's very Mm -hmm. thoughtful um and like in in the crafting of it you're you're maybe not so frightened as you are uh thinking about things in a new way uh, at the end mm-hmm. of the day. Um, sure. but yeah like I, I i mean if for for me i think this is a, a good watch for anybody just as a reminder because like when i saw this thing and was told hey we're gonna watch some drag movies uh, drag queen movies this week uh i was thinking that this was gonna be a little bit more like star booty in kind of style like the very colorful and over the top and you know lots of costumes and um, kind of kind of almost like a drag show like but you know elements of that dragged into a film but th- this was just a good horror film like you know it, and, it, and it, to me it's just a good reminder that you know just because a person is one thing doesn't mean they can't be something else and so Josh was a famous and very beloved drag uh, drag, drag queen as Peaches Christ but Josh was an amazing filmmaker and in my opinion, one of the better horror writers of uh, the last couple decades, maybe. I, I I think that that's very fair, and uh, and I'm I'm glad you guys enjoyed All About Evil as much as I did. Uh, and and Star Booty is is an interesting one to pair with this. And again, listeners, listen to my interview with Joshua Grinnell slash Peaches Christ next week. It is absolutely awesome. I also want to take this moment to again say, check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash cult and classic podcast. There is not only an opportunity to support us uh, with as little as a dollar a month, but also you get some really cool stuff. You can get uh, access to the videos of all of these podcast episodes. So you can see our beautiful beaming faces here from lockdown. And you also uh, get the opportunity to get uh, artist autograph trading cards made specially for cult and classic and uh, zines every month. Those are little magazines that are self-made and are super cool and have comics, articles, all sorts of fun stuff. So you can get some cool shit by becoming a patron for as little as $1 a month, uh, $5 or $10 a month. And we would love you forever. We will even mention you on the show. We might even make you a guest on the show if you wanted to do that. So listen, check out Colton Classic Podcast, wherever you find your podcast. And uh, clearly you're already listening, so you're good. Uh, But again, thank you guys so much. And to play us out, 
as always, is the chud. It just so happens to be the song written in homage to All About Evil called All About Evil. Here we go. Just a reminder to everyone, the clips used in this show are for review purposes only and are the uh, copyrighted content of the owners. Please visit The Chud at facebook.com slash The Chud Band and visit Cult and Classic at cultandclassicpodcast.com and Cult and Classic on Instagram and on Facebook. Thank you guys so much. Have a great day. We love you. Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening to Cult and Classic Podcast. This podcast is important to me, but what's more important are the rights privileges, and freedom from violence of everyone in this country and in this world. And that means supporting Black Lives Matter. If you'd like to make a donation, please go ahead and visit coltonclassicpodcast.com, where we have a list of places you can donate and help out. And please stay safe.